with Jesus in your boat. You can smile in the storm when you're sailing home. And you think about it. I would submit that's a pretty theologically profound and personally encouraging truth. Oh, yes. And I think I'm looking across this gathering right now, and there's a variety of people walking through storms in your life, in your family, some of you with kids, students, or with parents, in your work, in the world, in a world of war and strife. God, we pray for your peace and for your mercy over Ukraine and surrounding countries. But there's actually a way to smile even in the middle of the storms in our lives. Amen. The storms in this world, there's a joy to be had, an otherworldly calm and supernatural peace to be experienced in the middle of the storm when you're sailing home. And that's a good word, isn't it? The storm is not home. The storm is what you're in when you're on the way home. But the storm isn't home. Home is coming. Amen. As long as Jesus is in your boat, a home is coming where the storm will be no more. Amen. No more winds or waves of hurt or heartache or pain or grief or fear or anxiety. Now, one day we'll be home and the storms will be gone. Amen. And even just knowing that can make you smile oh, yeah. in the middle of the storm. And all of this only possible when Jesus, God in the flesh, is in the boat with you. Amen. You can smile when you know that the God who has power over the storm, the God who has purposes in the storm, the God who promises to get you through the storm, has not left you alone. Amen. And he is with you every step of the way. You're not facing that storm alone. So, you may not sing that song and do those motions this week. Or you may, in private. But, regardless, remind yourself of this truth. With Jesus in your boat, you can smile in the storm when you're sailing home. And I want to show you, that's true, according to this story of John the Baptist. So it's interesting the way Mark tells this story, because in verse 13, so let's get the picture. Where we left off last week, Mark tells us about Jesus sending his disciples out on this mission trip. And then if you jump down to verse 30, where we're going to start next week, he talks about these disciples coming back. But in between, Mark doesn't tell us anything about what actually happened on the mission trip. Instead, he tells us a story about John the Baptist that had happened way prior to this. If you don't know much about John the Baptist, he was the forerunner of Jesus who came baptizing people for repentance of sins and pointing them to Jesus. And this is the story of how he was martyred. And even in just the way Mark sandwiches this story of John the Baptist in between the disciples of Jesus going out on mission and coming back, he's making a point. Because these disciples were going out on mission into a hostile world into a world of storms, and it would not be easy for them. And this is a truth for all followers of Jesus to realize, from the youngest to the oldest, following Jesus on mission in this world will involve storms. Amen. So don't be surprised when they come. Don't be surprised at the cost that comes your way when you're on mission with the Word of God in this world. In fact, following Jesus on mission in this world may cost you your life. And this is good for all of us to realize, no matter how young or old we are. So even kids who are considering following Jesus hear loud and clear today from God that following Jesus could cost you everything. Follow along with this story 
as I read it from Mark chapter 6, verse 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah. And others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask for me whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. She came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorrow. But because, sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So yes, this is a very heavy story with a very clear picture of the hostility against God and his word and his ways in the world. Just look at King Herod. Here, you, you think your family tree is crooked? Try to follow this. So there are other Herods mentioned in the Bible. This one is Herod Antipas. Mark calls him King Herod. Matthew calls him Herod the Tetrarch. He's basically governor over a certain region of Roman occupation. And that region happened to be where Jesus' ministry was primarily taking place. Now, Herod had a wife who was the daughter of an Arabian king. And they got married as kind of a political military alliance. So you had Herod Antipas and his Arabian wife. Well, one day they go to visit Herod Antipas's half brother, or half brother whose name was Herod Philip. And Herod Philip was married to Herodias, which means that, so follow this, Herodias was Herod Antipas's sister in law. But not only was she his sister in law, Herodias was also Herod Antipas's niece. So you've got Herod Antipas married to his Arabian wife, Herod Philip married to Herodias, who is Herod Antipas' niece and sister-in-law. So during this trip to Philip and Herodias, Antipas decides he wants to marry Herodias, his niece, sister-in-law. So they sneak away together, and basically Antipas divorces his Arabian wife and marries his niece, sister-in-law, Herodias. And then, as if that wasn't enough, Antipas and Rhodius have a daughter together, the girl who's mentioned in this story, just to finish out her story, one day she marries her half-uncle, Philip the Tetrarch, and just like that, she becomes the sister-in-law and aunt of her own mother. Do you follow that? Now, if you're wondering why any of that really matters, it doesn't. But I just want you to see how messed up this picture is. And it's in this passage where we read about Herod hearing about all that Jesus and his disciples are doing in his region, which gets him scared because he thinks Jesus is John the Baptist come back to life, which then leads Mark to tell us the story of what happened. A while before this, when Herod's daughter did a dance before what was likely her drunk father and his friends offered her whatever she wanted, and behind the scenes, Herodias tells her daughter, ask for John the Baptist's head. 
All because John before that, at great risk to his own life, had called out Herod on his adulterous, incestuous actions. And as a result, Herod imprisoned John in a dungeon, but didn't want to kill him because there was a sense in which Herod respected John. But Herodias didn't. John was a threat to her marriage, so she had John killed. There's all kinds of things we could dive into at this point. But the main picture I want you to see is it's not just a story about John the Baptist. You see, this is in part a foreshadowing of the story of Jesus. Herod, with charge over a region where John the Baptist is preaching, and in his leadership, or lack thereof, he beheads John the Baptist. You fast forward one day to Jesus' trial, and you'll see in Luke chapter 23 that Pilate sent Jesus to, guess who? Herod. This same Herod, who would one day play another passive role that would lead to Jesus' death. But it's not just John the Baptist and Jesus. But Jesus' disciples, these same disciples who are out on a mission trip while Mark is telling us this story, You read their stories amidst Roman occupation and as they scatter into different places, apart from Judas who betrayed Jesus, for all we know, 10 out of 11 of those disciples died martyrs' deaths. The only one who didn't was John, another John, who was exiled on an island for speaking the gospel. So the Bible's clear. Kids, adults, mark it down. You give your life to following Jesus and speaking God's word, the gospel in this world, you will face more storms, not less. This wasn't just true back then. This is true today. Do you think Jesus is not just a hero, but the hero of all history? or maybe a more personal way to put it, is Jesus the hero of your life? So this is where I mentioned, if you just hang with me, if you're exploring Christianity, the story of the Bible is the story of one hero who is worthy of not just admiration, but awe and worship, and not just for a time, but for all time. It's the story of how God has formed and created each one of us fearfully and wonderfully in his image for relationship with him. But it's also the story of how all of us in different ways have turned aside from him, have sinned against him, chosen our ways over his word. And it's the story of how as a result of our sin, We live in a world of so many storms. It's a world that's separated from God. And if nothing changes, when we die, we will go to an eternity of everlasting suffering separated from God. But the Bible is also the story of how God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to this world to live the life that we could not live, a life of no sin. And then, even though he had no sin for which to die, he chose to die on a cross for sinners to pay the price for their sin. He died the death we deserve to die. And then the good news keeps getting better because he didn't stay dead long. Three days later, he rose from the grave so that anyone, anywhere, who turns from their sin and puts their trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord of their life will be forgiven of all their sin and restored to relationship with God now and for all of eternity. Jesus has lived the life we could not live. He has died the death we deserve to die. And he has conquered the enemy we could not conquer. He is the hero of all history. 
And he is the only hero who is worthy of all of our worship. We invite you then, from the youngest to the oldest, and within the sound of my voice, we urge you, put your trust in Jesus. Early in your life, as soon as possible in your life. Make Jesus the hero of your story. Your life now and forever depends on it. At the same time, know this. Know this one simple, significant truth today from God's word. If you believe that Jesus is the hero of history and that Jesus is worthy of all your worship, know that following him will not lead to an easy, comfortable life in this world. Not when you're following the hero who was crucified by this world. Not when you're following this hero who's leading you to another world. And along the way, it's calling you to forsake possessions and pleasures and pursuits in this world and the applause of this world because he knows all of these things are fading. None of them will last. So realize, regardless of how old you are, if you're in elementary school right now or middle school or high school, college, if you're in your 20s, or 30s, or 40s, or 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Regardless, if you're going to follow Jesus, you are joining in a line behind John the Baptist who gave his life pointing people to Jesus. He must become greater. I must become less. Which meant proclaiming God's word even in this world even when that cost him everything. So are you willing to follow Jesus in that line behind John the Baptist? If not, then you are not actually following Jesus. And you might say, but he died. They cut off his head in this world. But that's the point. John wasn't living for this world. He wasn't living for worldly kings and temporary pleasures. He was living for a heavenly king with everlasting pleasures. John wasn't living for an earthly hero. He was living and dying for an eternal hero. The question is, are you? And if the answer to that question is yes, If Jesus, the hero of history, is the hero of your story, then you can know this. No matter what storms you may face in this world, even down to the storm of death itself, you can smile because you know you're sailing home. Will you bow your heads with me? I just want to ask you that question. I ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, just to focus between you and God. Is Jesus the, the hero of your life? The Lord, Savior, King of your life. And if the answer to that question is not a resounding yes in your heart, then I invite you. This is the moment, the time where you Right there, you can just call out from your heart to God and say, God, I know you have made me for a relationship with you. I know I have turned away from you in so many ways. But today I believe that Jesus is the hero of all history who has died on a cross for my sin and risen from the grave so that I could have life so that I could be restored to you. So today I confess him as Lord, as Savior, as hero of my life. You call out on the name of Jesus in that way. The Bible says everyone who calls on his name as Lord will be saved from your sin, restored to God. God, I pray for that miracle to happen in hearts 
all across this gathering right now. And for all of us who have experienced this miracle, either for the first time in this moment or in times leading up to this, we thank you for this reminder today that the storms in this world are not the end. Even the reminder that following you and proclaiming your word in this world will lead to more storms, not less. We say to you, Jesus, the hero of history and the hero of our lives, you are more than worth it. We want to follow you wherever, however you lead us. We want to speak your word. Your, the good news of your love, no matter what that means for our lives. God, help us even this week and second week of this mission trip we're doing. God, please give us courage to, and boldness to speak your word, to speak the gospel, especially in light of the brothers and sisters in India for whom it's so much more costly than just our reputation or lack of comfort in a conversation. God, please help us to speak your word. And we pray that you would bring people to life in you today through your word spoken through us. Oh God, we look forward to the day when storms will be no more. We long for that day. At the same time, we praise you that you're in the middle of the boat with us right now. So lead us on, guide us, help us to live and die, proclaiming your word in this world as we look forward to see in your face and to the day when storms will be no more. In Jesus' name we pray. The name of the one who makes all this possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.